All right, so have you ever watched a movie, right? And the protagonist in the movie, all right, that lead character is running, and they're running right at the camera, you know, and usually there's something chasing them. But they're running right at the camera, and, and they stop, and they break what's called the fourth wall, all right? That's where a, a character within the, the TV show or the movie or the play, they address the camera, they speak to the audience. And usually when that's happening, they're running, and, they're, and they, they look at the camera, and they're like, you're probably wondering how I got in this moment. You ever watched one of those movies, one of those TV shows? You've seen those? All right, uh, I was watching, well, yeah, anyway, that was, I was watching one just a couple of weeks ago, and they, they used that, that, uh, that method of... In, yeah, introducing things. And so we sort of find ourselves in that moment right now, all right? We find that uh, ourselves looking, now we're in a series in the book of John, Jesus in the book of John, all right, uncontainable. And, and we're going to look today, though, in John chapter 13, we're going to look a little bit about Peter. You see, and, and here's what's happening. In, in those movie openings, it usually when they address, they break that fourth wall, then it usually scra- you know, scrolls across the screen, you know, three weeks earlier, or whatever the time frame is, and it takes you back. And then the rest of the movie works you from that back, back up to that opening scene. So with that, we're looking at Peter, and we find ourselves in this situation with Peter in John chapter, I know we're going to be in 13, but we're going to start real quick in John chapter 18, verse 27. It says, Peter again denied it. And at once a rooster crowed. That denied it right there was Peter denying that he knew Jesus. In fact, he had three different occasions. They had somebody had come up to him and was like, hey, aren't you that? You're one of those guys. I know you. And Peter's like, uh-huh. No, not me. In fact, we find in one of the other, the, the accounts there, it gives a, a different, you know, detail to it. And he says he, he cussed at him. You know, he got, you know, no, I am not one of those guys. I don't know who this Jesus is. I am not a Christ follower. And here's the thing. Jesus had warned them that this was going to happen. Here it is. Now, how did Peter, here's the question. So that's our opening. We break the fourth wall. Let's move back. How did Peter get to that moment? Because think about it. Peter had spent three and a half years following Jesus. He had three and a half years of of learning from Jesus, experiencing Jesus' grace, mercy, patience, love, his forgiveness firsthand. Okay, well, real quick, spoiler alert, okay? Peter's going to have his light bulb moment eventually, all right? And he's going to have many light bulb moments. And, and we're going to see that in, in Scripture. Uh, and, and I know that you know that. Well, in fact, Peter, after denying Jesus, is going to have restored fellowship. In fact, you find that in John chapter 21. You don't have to turn there. Verses 15 through 19. You know, that's another, you know, future message. But this, in John chapter 21, verse 19, real quick, we find Jesus demonstrating Peter's restored fellowship by offering him a familiar invitation. And that invitation is, follow me. It's the same invitation that Jesus offered Peter back in the very beginning, as we find it in the account of Mark there, when Jesus looks at him and says, follow me. I'm going to make you fishers of men. I'm going to give you a new purpose in life. And so when Jesus uses that phrase, follow me again here at the end, don't you see that, that beautiful picture where Jesus is bringing him back to that moment of, oh, I still have a purpose and a use for you in regardless of what I've done in my restored fellowship. But anyway, that's, that's a little bit of a spoiler alert. But what we see is once again, Peter experiencing Jesus's grace, mercy, patience, love, and his forgiveness. See, so now we know the rest of the story, right? Paul Harvey fans out there. But back to How did Peter get to that moment? What brought us up to that? So turn with me to John chapter 13. Now, we had said just a second ago that that Jesus had warned Peter that he was going to be in that moment, that that was going to happen. In fact, we find that in John chapter 13 in verse 38. It says, Jesus answered, he's talking to Peter, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly. Remember, when you see that truly, truly, you know, the old King James said, verily, verily, it's, it's, hey, listen up, pay attention. I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. See, what we see right here is not really about Peter. What we see is about Jesus. Jesus in his sovereignty and his omniscience, he knows 
who Peter is. He knows what Peter's going to do. Jesus knows who we are. All right, so with that, let's go back a little further though. That's the end of, uh, towards the end of John 13. Let's go back to the beginning, all right? In fact, let's start at verse one of John chapter 13. Uh, so what's gonna happen here is, is now we know this, there's been a, a crazy week going on for them. They find themselves in the, what this referred to as the upper room. Uh, they've gathered together, it's Passover. So they're going to celebrate the, the Passover meal together. And uh, there's been a lot going on. We know in some of the other accounts gives us some different vantage points and details on it. There's a lot of noise going on in the room, a lot of talk going on. Uh, we know that they have experienced uh, 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 some crazy things going on. And in the midst of all this, suddenly we find Jesus standing up from the table. He gets up and he takes off his coat, grabs a towel, he wipes it, or wraps it around his waist. And we find that he starts going to the disciples. You know, which one did he go to first? I, I don't know. But he, he starts to wash their feet in this moment. So let, let's look at verse one, okay? Verse one says, now this is Jesus' sovereignty. Jesus knew his omniscience that his hour had come. All right, let's continue on. The rest of that verse says what? Well, it talks about Jesus' love says, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So we see Jesus' sovereignty, his love. Now let's look at the example of Jesus. Verse five says, then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. So real quick, we start out with, an example, a lesson about who Jesus is. All right, and from that, now let's start to look again, getting Peter to that point, how'd we get there? Let's look at Peter's response to this lesson from Jesus. Now, real quick, it, it's easy, maybe not for you, I don't know, but for me, it's real easy, you know, to get on my high horse and start throwing some rocks at Peter, like, dude, if I would have been there, I wouldn't have done that. Yeah, right. Okay. So, and here's why I know that, that I would have probably done the same thing as Peter because here's what Peter was really doing. Peter thought that he knew best. All right, let's look at that. Let's look at this dialogue between Jesus and Peter. Let's look at verse six. So as this is un, you know, un, uh, uh, developing in front of him, Peter says to Jesus, Lord, do you wash my feet? All right, so Peter's like, dude, I, I know what's best. This... Jesus, you don't wash my feet. Well, Jesus has a response. Now, here's the response to the one that's in my head. I warned you guys about that all the time, being in my head here. This is Jesus, and again, this is the John translation, is Jesus saying, yes, trust me. Go with me on this. You'll see. Well, what he really said was, Jesus answered him, what am I doing? Excuse me, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward, you will understand. You're going to have this light bulb moment. Just go with me on this. But again, Peter thought he knew what was best. I know I do it all the time in my conversations with God. And we get to verse eight and says, Peter says, what? You shall never wash my feet. Now, here's what can happen when the Lord is leading us through the, through the Holy Spirit. We can have these light bulb moments, all right? We, we, I've done it. And it's this, Jesus is laying out, God, you know, he's speaking to us, the Holy Spirit in us as believers, and he's leading us in the direction. And we get this direction. And then for me, it's like, okay, I got it now. I'll get us there. Thanks. We're good. All right. And I'm like, I know he's given me sort of a couple of steps and I'm going to get us there and I'm going to get us there my way. So that's why I understand, man, there's no rocks for me to be able to throw at Peter here. So what do we got well, once again, we have a lesson right, on the love, the mercy, the grace, the patience of Jesus. You see, Jesus uses, I have written here, our, sorry. Jesus uses my arrogance, my impatience, my immaturity, my, well, let's bring that to our, whatever sin that so easily besets us, that, that trips us up. And he uses those moments as teaching moments. So real quick, let's now look into verses eight through 11. So right after, you're not washing my feet. 
we see a lesson about salvation and continuing fellowship. Let's look at this lesson. So Jesus says, hey, you know what? If I don't wash you, you have no share. You have no fellowship with me. So again, Peter thinking he knows what's best. What's his initial response right there? Oh, well, yeah, okay, yes, Jesus. So then, hey, dude, wash my head, wash my hands, wash my feet. Just let's just go to town right here. But yet Jesus has a response. Let's look in verse 10. Verse 10, Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean and you are clean, but not every one of you. See what he's, he's making this. Well, you know what he's telling us? He's telling us Ephesians chapter two, verse eight. He's telling us for grace, you've been saved through faith and it's not your own doing. It's the gift of God. Whenever you see through scripture, Old Testament and new, you see that idea of being cleansed or being washed. It is reference to salvation. It is reference to Jesus dying on the cross. It's John three sixteen. So that what? That our sins can be made whiter than snow, washed away in his blood. And so we see this lesson on salvation that Jesus is talking to believers. They've been washed by the blood, they are saved. But now he's making a deeper lesson about fellowship. See, the lesson is this is that yes, our sins have been forgiven, past, present, future but there are still those things that trip us up. There is sin in our life that hinders that relationship that we have. You know, the analogy I make is, is everybody in here at some point was young, all right? Let's think back real quick. Some of us have to go back further than others. But uh, you remember when you were in trouble, all right? And when you were in trouble, you didn't want to be around the person that would dole out the punishment, all right, whether that was a teacher, a coach, a parent, a grandparent, whoever the case may be, when we had done something wrong and we knew we had, there was that, that uh, you didn't want to be, you wanted to avoid eye contact. You, you didn't be around him. And that's what Jesus is getting at here. There are those things in our life that, that man, that's not the right thing to do. That's not what we are to do. Our sins are forgiven. Our salvation is set. But what he's letting us know here is that we've got to sometimes, we've got to wash the dirt off our feet. We've got to confess, oh Lord. Well, you know what? Well, no, we'll get to that. Yeah. Here's what we're really being taught. 1 John 1, 9. Now remember, 1 John 1, 9 is, is being written to believers. It says this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us. We see that cleanse, wash, from all unrighteousness. See, what we saw there in verse 10 is that our body is clean, that's salvation, but our feet still get dirty. That's our, our bad habits, that's sin, that's the old nature. So in the midst of Peter and these, these pushbacks on Jesus, Jesus even uses those moments for these teaching lessons. All right, so again, this is going on, let's put ourselves in real time with Jesus and Peter, All right? So, Let's continue on with this, this lesson. How did Peter arrive at that moment? Let's continue in chapter 13. So we have Jesus giving them a lesson of washing their feet. Then Jesus lets the disciples know that, that he will be betrayed by one of them. Now, this is a really profound statement that's being made there. And, and you know, what does Peter do right there? Peter immediately, he wants to know, man, it's just who Peter is. But, you know, maybe you picture in your head, what is it? I just went blank. Is it uh, Da Vinci? No, it's Michelangelo. The artist that painted the Last Supper, all right? Is that the one you have pictured in your head when we think of the Last Supper right there? What we do know is that John was next to Jesus. And, and I just, this again, we know that Peter does this. What it looked like, this is my imagination, but I could see Peter going, hey, John, John. John like, what? He goes, and now again, Peter's probably going, eh, yeah, John, yeah, you, you know, the one Jesus loves, okay, all right. Ask him, who is it gonna be, right? And of course, Jesus answers him and says, well, the one that I give this bread to. So what's happening here is Jesus is letting them know this is the beginning of the end. You know, all the things that we've been talking about and learning and I've been teaching you and we've been walking through for three and a half years, it's all coming to fruition right here. This is the beginning of the end. So let's move down. We're in John chapter 13 still. Let's look at verse 33. 
It says, little children, this is Jesus speaking, yet a little while I'm with you, you will seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. All right, now let's hold that thought in that statement. Let's remind ourselves. All right, verse one, what did we know? Jesus had said in verse one, he knew his hour had come. He was going to depart to the Father and that he loved them to the end. So with this revelation in verse 33 that, dude, I'm leaving and you can't come with me. All right, this is the beginning of the end. But what do we know? We know we loved him to the end. And so Jesus had another lesson. It was like, again, I got some students over here. You ever get towards the end of the class period and the teacher tries to go, you know, a million miles a minute to get all that last material out before the bell rings. You know, you know what I'm talking about, right? I, I, Jesus is the great teacher. So I, he wasn't, you know, caught off guard. So please hear me in that. But I just, I see if he goes, man, this is the beginning of the end. I've got some lessons I still need to teach you. I've got some things here going on. And so let's look in verse 34. All right. So in verse 34, it starts a new commandment I give to you. Like, whoa, okay that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, that's by loving one another, all right? By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, let, let's stop real quick. I mean, that, that, that's that side, boom, bombshell. All right, he's, he's dropped this on there and it's like, okay, let me, let me pause and sort of, drink this in. Let's look at the word all people. Now, again, I speak for me. I can't speak for y'all. But sometimes when I think all people, I think in this very broad term, there's, you know, all the people in the world, and I don't know all the people in the world, right? But let's put ourselves in, what were the disciples experiencing this moment? Remember, they had been with him three and a half years. In that three and a half years, all people meant, well, their group, right? The, the disciples. All people meant, well, they had seen them him feed thousands of people, Tw not once, but twice multitudes. In fact, all people, remember, just prior to this, they had seen the city of Jerusalem throw a party for Jesus as he came in. So all people in their minds, they're going back on all their journeys and thinking about all the people that they have met in small groups, whether it be the woman at the well in John 4 or the thousands that he fed and spoke to. So all people, it's not just this broad general term of, oh yeah, there's you know, people in another country. These are people that we come across. How are the people we know, that we see, that we don't know, but we cross paths with, whether we're sitting at a, a stoplight with them next to them in traffic, or we're in line behind them at HEB. These are our all people. All right. So with that, that's all people. All people are what? They're going to know that we're Christians. They're going to know about Jesus. Now, let's think about who was that said to right here? Uh, think about it. It was a group of bewildered, scared, selfish, uncertain, 11 followers of Jesus. Now, think about that. 2,000 years ago. Do we know about that to this day? See, when we follow, when we seek Jesus, when we're listening to his lessons, notice what has happened. All people is continuing from that group right there in that room to this moment right here in 2023. All people, that command, all right, that new command, it extends to us. All right, let, let's keep going. Okay, quick recap. So what Jesus said, he said, this is the beginning of the end. He says, I'm, I'm leaving you and you can't follow me. And remember, that was a statement of fact there. But then he said, look, when I'm gone, here's what you need to do. All right? You need to love each other after I leave. This is my new commandment. This is listen up. See, Jesus is saying something really big here. Oh, but Peter, what's Peter's reply? All of this, this is, this is groundbreaking right here. And Peter's reply is in verse 36. Lord, where are you going? It's sort of like he may miss the point a little bit. In fact, what Peter's doing, he's actually questioning a statement of fact by Jesus. And of course, we see in continued in verse 36. Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me, but you will follow afterward. 
So we, we get another statement of fact. And for me, I mean, it's Jesus speaking. That should have settled it, right? And everybody was like, okay, yes, Lord, got it. We're good. But, you know, what's Peter say in verse 37? Well, he, he does something that I would do. And he says, Lord, <laughs> why could I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And that brings us back to how did we get to that point? There's that beginning of, of Peter finding himself in denial of Christ and running out of that, that court where that happened and crying and just sort of broken. You see, Jesus in his sovereignty, he knew what Peter was gonna do. In his omniscience, he knows who we are. So let's think about this, all right? What had Peter already done? He had questioned the son of God, where are you going? But here's the thing. God's not afraid of our questions. I think so often we're like, I can't be real with God because, well, you know, he's going to be up there. And I don't know, maybe it's because in school we were forced to, to study Greek or Roman, you know, uh, history. And we, we picture Zeus in our head and there's a lightning bolt up there. And it whoosh. no, his love, his grace, his mercy, his patience. His forgiveness. God's not afraid of your questions. All right, go, look to, I, oh man, you guys that know me, you know I'm crazy about Psalms. Well, I'm crazy, but I'm crazy about Psalms. All right, and, and what is Psalms? So much of it, it's King David, dude, just bearing out his heart. Just, he's got these questions before God. He just lays it out there and it's raw and God's not scared of our questions. Because here's what I find. In those moments of truth with God, in those moments of, of rawness, me and him, it's not that he's like, no, John, and this is it. And he you know, slaps me around a little bit, not that I don't deserve it or need it sometimes, but I find the more I lay it out to him, the more I start to go, oh, I'm so sorry, I get it. And those light bulb moments happen when we're truthful and honest and transparent with God. Why would we not be? We've already seen he knows everything. He is sovereign. He's omniscient. And so us not being transparent in our prayer with him is hiding it from who? Him? No, it's hiding it from us. All right, so let's keep looking right here at Peter. So Peter, all right, he's given this answer by Jesus, but he wouldn't accept this answer from Jesus. And here's where he began to bargain with Jesus. You see, here's what happened. Peter lost his focus on the example of Jesus and on who Jesus is. Now, I know that Peter knows who Jesus is, all right? If you want to, turn to Matthew chapter 16, very quickly, verses 15 and 16. Here's what we find. We said, he said to them, this is Jesus, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That's the gospel, all right? That right there is this declaration of faith that Peter is. We know that Peter knows who Jesus is. So let's go back to John chapter 13. What's the lesson here? Who is Jesus? Look with me in verse 13. John 13, verse 13, it says this. This is Jesus speaking. You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. See, Jesus, he's rabbi, as, as Nicodemus called him when he, he approached him at night there. It means teacher. He is the one that in his patience, in his love us to the end, he is always trying to bring us along to that next step. He's, he's got these lessons for us and we just have to continue in faithfulness, seeking after him. He is our teacher, but he is Lord, right? He has the right to be that teacher because he is our Lord. And so who is Jesus? He's our teacher. He's our Lord. But look with me in verse 15. It says, for I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. You see, who is Jesus? He's our teacher, he is our Lord. He's our example. You see, Jesus isn't just a, hey, do what I say. Jesus is a do what I say, and let me show you how it's done. You know, those are the people that we like. Those are the teachers we like. Those are the bosses that we like. Those are the, the friends that when we're looking for help, right? And that's who Jesus is. He is our teacher, our Lord, and our example. How do, well, look at, you know what? Spoiler alert. Let's go forward a little bit. John chapter 21. 
John chapter 21 and verse 25. All right, so here's the question. What is the example of Jesus? Verse 25 says, now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. That's, that's sort of the, the, the arc verse for this series. The, the world is not a big enough library to hold all the things that could be written about Jesus. So with that, Jesus is our example. Let's just, hey, not everything. Let's look at what his example is for us here in John chapter 13. And it starts with this. He is our example of humility. All right, now let's realize what's going on in here. So this is a, a group of people, all right? This is a culture that traveled primarily by foot. They wore sandals, all right? And they weren't like me, you know, wearing socks with my, my Birkenstock, okay? I confess that right here. All right, so we've got bare feet in sandals. Now, I have not been there. I know some of you in this room have been there. You've been to Israel. But in the pictures that I look at, you know, when I see a lot of the countryside of Israel, you know what I see? I see the Texas Hill Country. Now, I know I'm biased, all right? That's why I call this place the promised land, all right? Don't, don't. But what's the point? Everyone in us in this room knows what a gravel, dusty, dirt road looks like in the Texas Hill Country. And if we're traveling with sandals on barefoot, we know what our feet would be like on a dusty summer day, don't we? And so within this culture, it was traditional for them to have, as a guest came into your house, Right? They would provide a way of washing that visitor's feet, that traveler's feet. Now, it was reserved, though, for the lowest of the servants. I mean, the, you know, the servants serve it. So anybody watch Downton Abbey? Okay, we're not talking about the butler. We're not talking about the footman. We're not talking about the second or the third footman. We're talking about the stable boy. Okay, we're talking there on the totem pole of servants. That's who would be reserved the duty of washing the guest's feet. Now, I don't know about you. I, I, I spent, you know, many, uh, many time around uh, 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 middle school boys in, in basketball, and, and I know what locker rooms smell like and buses smell like, and a lot of that comes from, well, um, feet. And so, you know, washing people's feet, let's think about that. All right? That's less sort of like, ew, yuck. That's reserved for the lowest, the lowest of the servants. And what do we have here? Jesus stands up. This is Jesus, all right? The son of God. You know, Peter knows who he is, right? And he sets this example for us. In fact, it's quite interesting. If you realize, you no, know, we talked about there was a lot going on in the room right there. You know, we know from Luke chapter 22 and verse uh, 24 that before this moment in that room, the disciples were arguing with each other about who was gonna be the greatest in the kingdom of God. They literally had just got, like, uh, who's going to be? Oh, it's going to be me. I ain't going to be you. It's going to be, uh, John's probably got the front runner on this. But now I'm going to be the greatest. Who's going to be the greatest? I'm going to be the greatest. They're arguing over who's going to be the top dog in heaven. Now, that's the mindset in the room. And then what does Jesus do? He washes their feet. It's humility. All right, so here's what we find in this lesson of humility. From an attitude of humility, we see the action of service. I, I know you, you guys have, have been around people. You get told what to do, all right? But so often, uh, you know, people tell you who they are, but you want to see who they are, right? You know, it, it's one of those where, where the, the actions, you know, speak louder than words. And that's what we've got going on right here. Jesus, he has this spirit of humility, but he's got this action of service. He actually puts who he is into play through service. In fact, we find in Hebrews chapter four, verse 15, for we do not have a high priest, Jesus, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every aspect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. You see, Jesus, he experienced everything we have experienced. And yet in humility, he continued to serve. So therefore, what does that mean? Well, it means Ephesians chapter five and verses one and two, which starts out therefore. So what do we do with this attitude of humility, this action of service? Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love 
as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. See, it's about being a humble servant. Now, the question becomes, how do we do that? Right? We do that through love. Because the example of Jesus right here of who is Jesus? Well, he's humble. He is a servant. And he loved them to the end. Let's go down to John chapter 13, verses 34 through 35. We read it just a moment ago. It says, a new commandment I give to you, that you what love one another. Now remember, he's talking to disciples. He's talking about believers, loving believers. You are also, as I have loved you, he set the example, you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You see, this commandment, this humility, this act of service is all because of Jesus' love for us. Remember, he set the tone right there, verse one. He loved them to the end. Here's the thing, we can sit in this room and I, and I get it, I'm with you. We're like, well, well, duh, of course. It's Jesus. Yes, he can do that. Yes, he did that. Yes, he does that. All right, but, but you know, we're, we're talking about me right here. I'm not so sure about this. So real quick, a little bit of a spoiler alert. We're going to go to John chapter 14. And, and I, I know, you know we might get into that next week with Pastor Paul right here, but we can't remove John chapter 14 from John chapter 13 right here. So turn to John chapter 14 and verse 15 with me. You see, because the attitude and the service are made possible through love and love is made possible through the Holy Spirit. Let's look at verse 15, chapter 4. He says, if you love me, this is Jesus, you will keep my commandments and all right, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. You see, we have this gift of the Holy Spirit that will help us through that. Can I love? Can I wash feet? Can I be humble and serve in my own ability? The answer is 100% no. But. We've been given something. Let's go, let's continue on. Verse 26 of chapter 14. But the helper, all right, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, how to love, and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. You're to love one another. And so how do I know that we can do this? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. I know you guys know this. Turn to Galatians chapter five, verse 22 and 23. Galatians chapter five, verses 22 and 23 says this, but the fruit of the spirit, and it just knocks it out of the park right there. The fruit of the spirit, the outpouring, the outworking of the Holy Spirit in us is what? It's love. And then it continues on. Joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Man, you can't make any rules that say you can't do that because nobody wants to stop people from doing that. And as you've heard me say before, if you're wondering what does love look like, made possible by the Holy Spirit? Well, it looks like all the other things that are in that list. When we have joy with each other, when we are patient with each other, when we are faithful, well, it just continues on. It's the expression of love. You see, so Jesus' example was one of humility. He put it into action in service. And he loved to the end. And we can follow that example because he is the one that made it possible through us. Uh, you know what? You're in Galatians 5. Look up to verse 13. It says what? But through love, serve one another. See, without love, what are we doing? If they're going to know that there's something different about us, right? The all people, and they're going to know it by our love, and we don't have, well, you know what? Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. 1 Corinthians 13, 1, it says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or clanging cymbals. I'm, I'm a toddler in the kitchen with a bunch of pots and pans in a wooden spoon, and I'm just banging and making racket. It's not music. It's just noise. Because that's what we are without love. See, here's the thing. So Jesus points us to humility, service, and love. But remember verse 14, all right? Remember, he's the teacher, he's the rabbi, he's the master. He doesn't owe us an explanation. He doesn't owe us a why that we are to follow this example. He doesn't owe us anything. 
But I think it's amazing. He does tell us why. Now, we, we like those teachers, don't we? You know, you're given an assignment and here's what you do. And, but here's why. Here's why we want to do that. You know, it helps us see that big picture. And so Jesus does that as the rabbi. Verse 35, John chapter 13 says, By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You see, see where we're going? We just keep coming back to that. You see, we love so that others will know not about who we are, not as fellow believers in this room, not as Boverty Baptist Church. All right? We love one another so that people will know who he is. Because it's always all about Jesus and it's not about us. Our interactions with each other are just to open a doorway to let us show people who he is. See, so there is a world, there's an all people out there. Your family, your neighbors, your classmates, your coworkers, your friends, your teammates, your teachers. And they have this, this God-shaped hole in their heart and they're looking to fill it with something. I don't know, money, power, position, prestige, drugs, alcohol, sex, self-help, self-esteem, philosophy, pleasure, good works, personal morality, relationships. They're looking to fill it with any number of things. See, but here's the question. Will they see Jesus in us by how we, the people in this room, the people that are watching online, will they know who he is by how we treat each other, talk about each other, serve, love one another. Because that's how they're going to know we're a Christian. And from that, that's how they're going to know who Jesus is. So as our worship team comes to the stage, may we look at this example. May we realize who Jesus is, what his example is, and what that means for us. So if you would stand with us as we sing Christ, our hope in life or death.